Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm gonna show you how to test an ordinary in your car. This is the part 2 of my video on how to tell if your car has a bad battery or a bad alternator. In part 1, we were looking at 4 ways to diagnose a car battery. Today, we are looking at the alternator. And I'm gonna show you guys some common alternator issues which you can easily diagnose by yourself. So if you're a beginner and you're watching this to diagnose your car's alternator, this will be a complete guide for you. Now that's enough talking, let's begin. Every time you turn the key to start your car, you will see your battery light comes on, which tells you that your battery is not getting any charge. After you start the car, the light should go off as the alternator is providing electricity to maintain the battery and the electrical demand your car needs to run. If the light didn't go off after you start the car or the light comes on while you're driving, that indicates you have an alternator related issue. Let's start with a basic alternator voltage test using a multimeter. First, you want to connect the multimeter to the battery. And you want to check the battery voltage. Then you want to start the car and see the alternator charging voltage. As you can see, I have around 13.9 volts and that indicates a good charging voltage. Charging voltage in a car depends on four main factors. Running temperature of the alternator, state of charge of the battery, load on the alternator and the battery temperature. In general, the range between 13.5 volts and 15 volts is considered as a good charging voltage. But modern cars have ECU controlled alternators that has a much wider range. So you want to check the service manual for your car to find out the exact voltage range for your car's alternator before you start testing. You can find these service manuals online or you can buy a book like this. They are real handy and they have all the information you need. Then you want to do a load test on the alternator. You want to turn on the headlights, AC and as many accessories as you can. This will increase the electrical demand on the alternator. Alternators have a higher efficiency at higher RPMs, so you want to raise the engine RPM to around 2000. In this car, the rated alternator voltage range is between 13.2 volts and 14.8 volts. As you can see, I'm getting around 13.5 volts, which is well within the specs. Just like the battery, alternators also have positive and negative terminals. Positive terminal is called the B post. It is connected to the battery using a cable, and the cable goes inside the wiring harness. To the fuse box and onto the battery. The negative terminal is the alternator housing. Here is the negative wire going out from the battery and it is bolted onto the car's chassis. So the entire car's chassis becomes a giant negative terminal. So different components in the car can share the body as a ground connection. Here is the ground wire goes to the engine. Because the alternator is bolted onto the engine, the alternator housing becomes a ground for the alternator. Then you want to connect the multimeter directly to the alternator. Now we have to compare this reading against the previous reading we had on the battery. If you see more than 0.5 volts of a difference in the readings, you have a voltage drop between the battery and the alternator. So you want to find where the drop is. Let's check the positive side first. Connect the red lead to the B post and the black lead to the positive battery post. The reading should be less than 0.2 volts and I only have a few millivolts. If the reading is about 0.2 volts, you want to check between the B post and the cable and also between the cable and the battery post. If those connections are good, then the cable itself is bad and you have to replace it. To test the ground connection, connect the red lead to the alternate housing and the black lead to the negative post on the battery. Again, the reading should be less than 0.2 volts. If it is more than 0.2 volts, you have a bad ground somewhere. So you want to check all the ground connections until you find the bad one. You also want to check the alternate amount because that is where the alternate is getting the ground. If you found any bad positive ground connections, you want to take them off, give it a good clean, apply some silicone paste and reinstall them back. That's how we do a basic alternator test using a multimeter. Diagnosing alternator issues in a car requires some serious testing than this. Let's start with drive belts. Alternators are driven by drive belts. So if you hear a squealing noise when the engine is running and your alternator is undercharging, the first thing you want to check is the drive belt to see if it is worn out or too loose. If you notice little cracks or shiny strips along the belt, that indicates a worn out belt and you want to replace the belt. If the belt is too loose, you may have a bad belt tensioner, so you have to replace that. Some modern alternators come with decoupler pulleys, which act as a clutch to eliminate belt vibrations so that the engine can run very smooth. 
but they can fail over the time and may create an undercharging condition. A failing decoupler pulley will make a rattling noise right after you stop the engine, and eventually it will rattle all the time. To replace the decoupler pulley, you want to get a pick like this to take off the dust cap. Now that's what I'm talking about. That is all the clutch material from the worn out clutch. Then you need a 17mm hex socket and an impact wrench to loosen up the pulley. If you don't have an impact wrench, you can also use a breaker bar with some WD-40. Now it is time to take a look inside the alternator. First, you want to remove these three bolts to take off the dust shield. Then you want to remove these four bolts so you can take off the front housing. If your alternator is rattling and if it is not the decoupler pulley, then it's the bearings that make in the noise. And look how easy it is to replace them. Alternators use electromagnetic induction to generate electricity. So the alternator also needs some electricity from the battery. So if you're having a no charge or an intermittent charging issue, the first thing you want to check is the power connection to the alternator. You can easily do this with a multimeter. So connect the black lead to the negative battery terminal and use the red lead to contact each terminal inside the connector. The top tip here is to get a small pin to probe into the connector so you wouldn't damage the terminals. You can also use a test light or a power probe for this. And you can use a wiring diagram in your service manual to identify the wires. If you are getting a bad reading at the connector, then you have to check all the wiring for any shorts or damaged wires. You also want to check the fuses and relays for the alternator. A good fuse should look like this. Modern cars are very sensitive to voltage variances. So you want to check all the fuses for resistance and make sure that they are all within specs. To test relays, you can use some jumper wires to manually operate the relay or you can get a relay tester like this. They are real easy to work with and also very inexpensive. In some cars, the power or the ground supply to the alternator is controlled by the ECU. In this type of a design, you can use a jumper wire to bypass the ECU and manually supply power or ground to the alternator. If the alternator is then working, then either the wiring coming from the ECU is bad or the ECU itself is bad. If that is the case with you, you have three options. Bypass the ECU, rebuild the ECU or replace the ECU. Before we go any further, we have to learn how alternators work. When the alternator is getting current from the battery, this current goes straight into the voltage regulator. Depending on the battery voltage, the voltage regulator then adjusts the amount of current it passes onto the brush assembly. The brush assembly is contacting these two slip rings, so this rotor is now getting current. Rotor has a lot of copper winding, so when the rotor is getting current, it becomes an electromagnet. Around the rotor is the stator, and it is also made of three separate copper windings. Each end of the winding is connected to a couple of diodes. So when the rotor is spinning, it induces a current on the stator. Because the rotor is continuously spinning, the polarity of the magnetism received by the stator is also continuously changing, so as the direction of the current being generated on the stator. This is called the alternative current. Because the car needs direct current, this current is then sent through a couple of diodes to convert into the direct current. Because the stator has three separate windings and each one needs two diodes for the conversion, six diodes are needed in total. This six pack of diodes is called the rectifier. The other end of the rectifier is the B post. So this DC converted current is going to the battery. Now we have to test each of these components. To test the voltage regulator, you want to rev up your engine to around 2000 RPM and you want to take a reading on the multimeter. Then you want to raise the RPM a few times and see the voltage again you shouldn't see a rise in the voltage between higher RPM ranges. As you can see, I get a steady reading of 13.9 at all times. If the voltage is rising as you rev the engine, that means the voltage regulator is bad. This is the main reason for an overcharging condition. In most alternators, voltage regulator is very easy to replace. Modern cars have easy controlled alternators, where the power supply to the alternator is regulated by the car's computer. If a wire that carries current can be turned on and off multiple times in a very short period of time, the average voltage on the wire can be changed. The percentage of the time the wire is turned on in a given time scale is called the duty cycle. So in ECU controlled alternators, ECU is sending a duty cycle signal to the voltage regulator, which means the current on the wire goes to the alternator is turned on and off hundreds of times a second. 
By controlling the duty cycle, EC can control the average voltage on the wire. When the voltage regulator receives this pulsing signal, the alternator can then generate just the right amount of electricity the ECU needs. Voltage regulator also sends a signal back to the ECU so that the ECU knows how much current is generated at the alternator. Basically, what you need to do is to identify the two wires that comes from and goes to the ECU and check the duty cycle on both wires. If the ECU is not sending a duty cycle, then the wiring between the ECU and the alternator is bad or the ECU itself is bad. You need to know that ECU is also receiving data from other sensors to decide the duty cycle that goes to the alternator. So to test this entire system, you need to have an OBD2 scanner that can read live data. On the other hand, if the voltage regulator is not sending a signal back to the ECU, then the voltage regulator is bad. Unfortunately, you cannot test a duty cycle signal using a multimeter. And you need to have an automotive scope for that. And they are very expensive. That's how you test a voltage regulator in an ECU control alternator. The next thing you want to check is the brush assembly. Because the brushes are spring loaded, they are always pushing against the slip rings. If they are worn out and too short, they will not make any contact with slip rings, which might cause an intermittent charging issue in the beginning and lead to a no charge condition eventually. So you want to measure the brush length and make sure they are making good contact with the slip rings. If the brushes are worn out, you can easily replace them. The top tip here is to use a pin to lock the brushes in place so you can easily place them around the rotor. To check the rotor, you're going to do a simple continuity test. And also the resistance across the slip rings should be around 2.7 ohms. Testing the stator is similar to testing the rotor. You just have to check the continuity. Now we have come to the rectifier. Rectifier acts as a one-way valve for the current. So turn the dial into diode test mark and connect one lead to the B post and the other lead onto the alternator housing. Then you want to swap the leads over and see the reading again. If the rectifier is good, you should have very high reading in one direction and zero reading in the other direction. If you are doing this test while the alternator is in the car, then take off all the connections before you begin. Another way to check the rectifier is to check the alternative current output on the alternator. Even though the alternator is supplying direct current, a very small amount of alternative current is still coming through the rectifier. So now you want to turn the dial into AC volts and see the reading. For many older cars, the reading should be less than 50 millivolts, but some modern cars are rated up to 100 millivolts. This is a very important test to do in an alternator. An alternator can have a very good charging voltage, but it may put out too much AC current into the car's electrical system, which can trip trouble codes in other computer control systems, which are designed to run by DC current. Also, an internally shorted out rectifier is a very common reason to have an overnight battery drain as it is one of the very few components in the car that is directly attached to the battery. The next question you may have is where to find the replacement parts for your alternator. You can find these parts from spare part shops or from online shops. Some alternator parts are very easy to replace while some need special tools to work on them. So if your option is to replace the alternator, you have three choices. Buying a brand new alternator finding a used one or buy a remanufactured alternator. Some high-end cars use water-cooled alternators and finding a used one could be challenging. So buying a brand new one is the only way to go. I already have another video showing how to replace an alternator. I'll put the link to that video in the description down below. Now that's how you probably test an alternator in your car. Thanks for checking out this video and if you want to learn more do it yourself videos like this, you can consider subscribing to the Junkie DIY Guy channel so you will never miss another video. All the tools I have used in this video are in the description down below so you can easily find them and I'll see you in the next one.